Okay, and from there we've got uh, we've got a, an interview with uh, with Tom, which we uh, pre-recorded, so we can listen to that now. All right, okay, so we're lucky enough to uh, to speak with uh, Tom Coyd, the current head coach of England Wheelchair. Tom, thank you for spending a bit of time and uh, chatting to us today. Morning, guys. Great to speak to you as always. Tom, we'll um, jump into um, the future of England, which took place this weekend. Um, just uh, for, for our viewers, can you just tell us a little bit how this fixture came about? And um, yeah, that would be a good place to start, really. Yeah, well, I'll start us back 18th of November 2022, which was the... the England lifting the Wheelchair Rugby League World Cup. And since that moment, the sport has completely boomed, like yeah. more than we were prepared that it would. And if I'm being honest, our planning had only gone as far as like 9.30pm on uh, <laughs> on the 18th of November. We really weren't ready for anything that was going to come after that. And what has come is more than doubling of the player pool more than doubling of the amount of active teams playing at every level of the competition. Um, and that's meant that our development pathway uh, wasn't really catering for many of those players who weren't on our national performance squad with England. They had some amazing emerging talent, but they weren't really being um, they weren't really being carried through a meaningful development pathway. They were playing well for their clubs. Yeah. They weren't quite breaking into the top level England squad and they were just kind of stuck in limbo. So the Future of England event uh, was my uh, aim to give them an opportunity to play under bright lights in front of the big crowd with pressure and consequence, you know, more than they would get playing at their championship or Super League clubs uh, and try and replicate what a test match would feel like to see how they coped with it. And um, Tom... Just talk me through the the uh, the run up to this this fixture. Then, did you get chance to have these? Obviously, you've been looking at these players in the Super League, and you've been keeping an eye on people. Did you get chance to have these groups of players together um, for for a sort of pre run or training session before the event? We did. So, me and the, my staff put together a national development program, which focused on our three key stakeholders in in the sport. First one being players, of course. And we had uh, 19 players come to two development days. So one was in York and one was in Hull, um, sort of like end of April and beginning of May. And then the other two stakeholders which we wanted to develop were the coaches at the Championship Super League and Development Clubs and also the referees who are working in the competition. So we, we threw the doors open to any coach or anyone who was interested in being a coach and all of the match officials as well to come and watch how England train. So we trained the players exactly how we would at a, a national performance squad session. We let the coaches observe. We had um, like several kind of like discussions with them during the day about why the session plan was the way it was and what we were trying to get out of the players. And then towards the end of the day when we played matches, the match officials came in and facilitated those. So they got extra refereeing practice. And it was like a holistic, you know, trying to target every key stakeholder of our sport, not yeah. necessarily saying that the way that England do things is the way to do it, mm. but it's our way of doing it. And if we can get people together and sharing ideas, then that's going to help everybody. And is this, is this sort of your own your own idea or are you modeling a different sport and what's happened in other sports or you know how, how did the, the the original idea come about so uh, wheelchair rugby league has lots of similarities with running rugby league of course and similarities with other team sports but what it also has is some real nuances and unique characteristics because of the population that play and coach within it and people who are wheelchair users people who don't work full time because of their disability obviously have different habits, different behaviours to the kind of general population, if you like, the majority of people who who do work full time and aren't a wheelchair user. So while we we did take ideas from, you know, what you see in like, I don't know, county rugby union models and things like that, where it's like you you get regional um talent together and train them and, and see how they perform on a representative level. We really listened to feedback and bounced ideas off of, you know, the people who we were trying to service. Uh, and I've got to shout out Dave Banks, 
who uh, is the assistant coach with me at England Wheelchair, because it was his original brainchild to say, we need to put some kind of programme together to capture these emerging talented England players because we might miss them otherwise. You know, they might get their head turned by another sport and um, we really want to get them in and, and get them to fall in love with the England badge so that we've got that upward pressure of really, really promising players putting pressure on people like Lewis King, Tom Halliwell, Seb Bashara, you know, these yeah. established England players to keep forcing them to get better. And also what was arguably more important was upskilling the coaches because they're the people that are helping the players on a week to week, whereas we're only seeing them a few times a year. And then the actual logistics of, did they bring their own chairs? Did you have a, a, a like a like a group of chairs that they could use? How did that work? So the, the logistics was part of the test, to be honest, because, um, you know, we, we need our players to be self-sustaining. We need them to take their kind of engagement in the sport seriously. So most of the players will, are at a point where they've got their own chair, either through, you know, like a sponsor and funding or the support of their clubs. So the clubs will have kind of assigned them a chair. And all part of the test to see if they were ready to be part of an England programme was, can they get their chair there? You know, can they transport it, whether it in their own vehicle or they've got a, you know, a loving parent or, or friend who's going to run them there and back? Can they make sure that their tyres are pumped up, that the bearings are, are greased and not full of dust from a sports hall floor? And it was, you know, it was all part of observing what sort of, what their character was like, as well as their playing ability. Because you, you really don't know um, what sort of person's going to turn up. You know, it could be anyone kind of looking good in a Super League game or a championship game, but it's not until you ask them to get out of that environment and come into a brand new one, see how they react, that you really understand what sort of person they are. And Tom, just touching on the, the, the teams then that you selected for this, obviously you've been keeping an eye on people. Um, a couple of names I recognise who sort of been in and around the England camp before, uh, Jack Eggie, Adam Rigby, uh, Freya Levy, has she been in the England camp before? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Tell me how you went about picking the, the two squads then for, for the competition and and really give a, a bit of a shout out to anyone who's, who's really been um, pushing the boundaries this year. So um, we, we had a, a national performance squad last year of which seven players didn't play for England. Yes. So all of those seven were um, kind of transferred into this development program to give them more opportunities to train with England, but also as kind of a leadership role, really, because they, they've got experience of what an England camp looks like. So they were they were first and foremost our cultural architects, if you like. If we had a brand new, yeah. fresh group, it would have been a lot harder for them to understand how to behave, what to do and when to do it, like on the pitch and off the pitch. So we had um, people like... Like, as you say, Jack Hegley, Tom Martin, Ewan Clibbins, Adam Rigby, Jason Owen, Freya Levy, um, and Tristan Norfolk, who was pulling up trees for Hollow Sea last season. They've all came into the national development programme um, and joined a group of people who have never been, um, I, I, never been some of them at a representative engagement in wheelchair, you know, like for any home nation or, you know, it may be their first representative engagement in sport. So, you know, they're coming in real kind of bright eyed and bushy tailed. Yeah. There was two, two players from Sheffield Eagles who play in the championship, Chris Haynes and Stephen Riley. So to have two players come up from the championship was hugely exciting because, um, you know, you'd assume that it would only be super league players we're looking for, but, but they tried to cast a really wide net. And and that that must be massive for them because Sheffield Eagles is not long formed as it is a wheelchair setup. It, their growth has been incredible. They, you know they were getting going um, the year before the World Cup happened, and they're now in a position where they can run three teams, including a women's only team. They could probably run two women's only teams and a youth team, so like under sixteen. Um, yeah. I didn't realise how much of a hotbed Sheffield would be for wheelchair rugby league, but um, they've got a great relationship with the EIS there, a great relationship with 
their foundation and the running game club. So yeah, they're just absolutely flying at the moment. Tom, just uh, just sort of looking forward, what's coming up in uh, like the, the the near to medium term for England wheelchair rugby league at the minute? So uh, we're going to let the dust settle from the big game yesterday. We had um, eight eight players aside just going hammer and tong really, and they knew that it was effectively a trial match for our national performance squad. Yeah, it was also great to see we had three players from the southeast: Mason Boonton, Jason Owen, and Freya. Yeah. who played for the London Roosters. So that that representation outside of Rugby League Heartlands was amazing to see. Uh, and Dave Banks and I have got a, a tough challenge on our hands because we've got to select the national performance squad for 2024 now. Uh, and that's going to be announced on Thursday of this week. So that squad will then carry through. Yes. Um, Super League season kicks off in two weeks. So it, yeah, it would be a week on Saturday, I think the first round of Super League. And we'll be training with that national performance squad to prepare for uh, three test matches, which are soon to be announced at the end of this season. So um, end of October through to November, we've got three test matches lined up. Excellent. And I know you were not going to want to give anything away regarding your squad, but I'm going to ask you anyway. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Without being too disrespectful, some of the England uh, elite players, it it is a little bit of an ageing squad now, isn't it? Are we going to expect to see uh, new faces within that squad pushing pushing into that squad this year? One hundred percent. Yeah, and and it, it, it's not just for the sake of it because we've done this development program and we want to be able to say that we carried people through from it. Yeah, I think it's so important that there's a, a transparent and open door pathway to the to the elite level, both for the people at the bottom of the pyramid who have that ambition and want to be able to carry that hope, but also for the, for the guys who have been sat at the top for a long time, um, who just might be getting a little bit complacent. And if if we bring that new blood through, it just gives everyone a kick up the butt. And it makes, it makes me coach better, you know, because you want to impress new players when they come in, you want to show them how good the program can be. So um, there'll definitely be more than a couple of, of brand new faces coming in this year. Tom, it's always an absolute pleasure to to hear you speak. I think you speak incredibly well and very passionate about the sport. I think a lot of Super League coaches could learn a lot from from, <laughs> from the way that you speak about your sport. So uh, thanks for me for uh, for sharing your time with us. Yeah, and for me, Tom. Right. Yeah, thanks for coming on, mate. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm really excited to see what the future holds for England Wheelchair Rugby League. I, I can't wait to see the, I can't wait to see the squad, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, fixtures announced as well. Craig, Carl, great speech as always. I, I so appreciate your support of our sport, uh, and I've also got a little bit more empathy for you now for, from putting on our own festival. <laughs> uh, I pro- pro- probably lost as much hair as you did uh, putting on the Midlands <laughs> Nine, so I'm right there with you guys. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Tom, thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.